All right. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate everyone being on the call today. Hopefully, you can hear me okay. Um, this is Ted Funk from the TWIP team. This is a regional informational webinar to kind of bring you everyone up to speed about what we've been doing on the TWIP team here. I'll probably talk for about 35, 40 minutes or so, and then that should leave enough time for questions if you have any at the end. Okay, let me just start out first of all by telling you who the TWIP membership is. We have eight people on the team. Four are SUs and four are forecasters, three leads and one journey. And the map here uh, shows the locations of where we are located across the region. Okay. Now the eight of us here, um, I don't know what the perceptions are uh, or the understanding of the TWIP team and what we're all about, but we're just ordinary people here. Uh, we work with you in your offices. We work shift. We have a lot to do. Let me tell you, the, for the eight of us, the TWIP uh, team, the TWIP objectives and initiatives and things we want to do could be a full-time job for all of us, but obviously that's not the case. We fully understand the reality of operations and staffing and staff shortages, that there's plenty of uh, requirements with training all the time. Right now it's the GO16 course. Uh, we get that. We also know and realize that there's a lot of talented people out there okay, across our region, people who take pride in their work take pride in their warning decisions to serve the customers and our partners in the best way that they can. So our team is here and was selected to enhance that process of making good decisions. Okay? And we do this by creating uh, training by the people, which is us, for the people, which is you and us. So the creation of this team here was assembled by the Central Region Consistency Team, which does have a couple members of Central Region Headquarters on it. Uh, and the, the basis for this was because significant differences ex exist across the region in terms of verification, probability detection, and false alarm rate, and obviously then our uh, subsequent uh, decision support services. And there's reasons for this. And I got them listed here. Inconsistent education experience among people across the region. Um, people using different data sets or maybe not using the right data or not applying them correctly, both in radar and in the near storm environment. Philosophical differences in QLCS warning paradigm. And what I mean by that quickly is that um, some people may not worry as much about the fleeting EF0 if you could actually forecast that from a radar uh, map or in just warn for ones that are potentially stronger. But uh, those differences those philosophies uh, create differences in service, and we want to address that as well. Next one is big, human factors, behavior, personal biases, uh, personal experiences and what people do, uh, what motivates them, what makes them do this or do that. These are important, and they create differences across the region. And then finally, office culture and the operational environment and what type of environment people are working within and the service then that gets created out of that environment. So we've identified four major areas here that are components to enhance the tornado warning process. I guess you could call these our goals. Um, the first one, and this is what we've been tasked to do by the consistency team, is to develop a consistent scientific approach and a comprehensive education program, uh, one that continues. All right? It's just not something you do and then be done with it. It's, it's a continued education pro uh, program. It's, for, it's fo I'm sorry, it's focused on the tornado warning decision process. It's all about the process, and we'll talk more about that as we go here. Uh, the second bullet here, we want to increase consistency and confidence, confidence in people and what they do across central regions. So we want decisions to be more science-based, less human-based. Uh, to do that and to create a better process, we need to create ways to uh, have more efficient integration of data. There's a ton of data out there, and we'll talk about that more in a little while provide strategies of how do we take this data, put it together, and use it the most efficient way that we're using the right data in the right situation to produce the right decision. And then recommended actions that we'll have from the team that we think will enhance severe weather operations in general. So here's our expectation. We expect that everyone will embrace the TWIP training and the efforts as we uh, deliver it locally. Okay, that will be administered locally. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. We also expect everyone to improve, but not everyone's going to be an expert. Uh, not everyone can be. 
let's say we take the analogy we have a long road and at the beginning of the road is someone who has really no experience it's the novice in, in issuing tornado warnings and at the end of the road I guess the pot at the end of the rainbow here is the supreme expert in tornado warnings and, and, and decision makings related to that. Now, I don't know if anyone's there. If they are, maybe they're, they, they're not really not there. They're actually further back in that row. But the idea is everyone is somewhere along that path. We want everybody going in the same direction to improve. Okay? Not everyone's going to be at the same level, but everyone's going to improve. And that improvement will help the overall operations and improvement in the service. We fully expect that regional differences will continue from one uh, location to another, one office to another, but that that difference will decrease. And obviously, we're not fooling anybody here. Unwarned events, false alarms, they will continue. But again, hopefully, the service uh, gets better and those events uh, decrease. So TWIP liaisons, you may or may not know that we have a representative in each WFO who uh, we identify to work with us. That may be a forecaster in your office. It may be the SU. Uh, or maybe in a couple offices, it may be actually a member of this team. All right. Well, there are communications conduit, the person that is kind of our point of contact to tell us about concerns and efforts going on locally, and kind of local champions to help implement the deliverables that, the deliverables that we provide to the office. Well, we want these folks to also encourage honest, non-threatening assessments of self, okay? You've got to look in the mirror, right? When something goes wrong, look at yourself first and figure out, did I do something right? Did I do something wrong? How can I improve? And then also the office in general as well. And the local Twipple and Sue uh, can lead that uh, type of initiative. And anybody, for that matter, can lead that initiative at a local office. And then we uh, will uh, be asking for information from Twipples to upload some information to the Google site that we have for review that can help us in you know, our efforts going forward. All right, SMEs and collaborators. Obviously, like I said, we're ordinary people. We don't have all the answers. We don't have all the knowledge. We need folks. All right? We need subject matter experts and various collaborators to help in training development and in everything that we're trying to do here. So here's a list. I'm not going to read them all obviously, but this is just some selected SMEs and collaborators. This is not necessarily an all-inclusive list, and this isn't a list that's stagnant. This will continue to evolve and likely increase as we go forward. But if you look at this quickly, you can see that the reach of the TWIP team is pretty far. It's definitely outside of just Central Region, working with folks down at WDTD, Penn State University with some dual poll type things. Not yet, but eventually with uh, FACET and NSSL. Um, some near storm environmental uh, people and teams helping us there. Um, and even down at the bottom, I mean, we talked to folks back in June when we were in Kansas City to the operations proving ground, and they offered their services if we ever have a need to, to do any concept testing. And maybe even the HWT, where they're already doing uh, a lot of testing of a lot of new uh, types of, of things that we eventually have gotten into operation. So uh, there's a lot of people, a lot of organizations helping, and this is a good thing. So here's the topics, topics and initiatives, uh, kind of headlines here of the different categories of, of topics that we're working on. And I'm going to address on each one as we go through, give you kind of a background of where we are, what we're doing in each. The Human Factors Meteorologist Survey, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Uh, warning Ops and your Severe Weather Ops Plan, Communication, Radar Interpretation, are the basic nuts and bolts training, the conceptual models. Again, I mentioned strategies of, of uh, how to put data sets together in the most effective way. Mesoanalysis is very important. And then a verification and event reviews and how that can be useful to the whole process. The material that we deliver, uh, and I'll get in that near the end of the presentation of, of what to expect when. Uh, this is the ways we'll deliver it. It'll be through various videos, like YouTube videos, uh, modules, and PowerPoints. It'll be some webinars, maybe some simulations, job sheets, and then kind of like one-pager type memos that uh, are easy to uh, implement that we think will enhance operations. Well, let's look at the meteorologist survey. Um, I'm hoping that many of you out there um, participated in that. This was done a number of months ago. It takes a while to uh, 
congeal and congregate all that information to, to get results. We're still working on that and trying to determine recommendations from it all. But I'm going to show you some selected results here, which I think you'll find interesting and we found interesting. and kind of gives you a, an idea of why the TWIP team is important to have and, and where we can improve collectively as a whole region in the process and the service. Okay, we had 326 responses to this, which we thought was really good. My back of the hand math figured out that that's roughly 63% of all the WFO meteorologists across central region. And there you can see in the first bullet um, the different uh, categories there were within the survey. Um, as I briefly alluded to just a minute ago, the human element is really important. We think that's as important or more important than the science. In the warning decision process, let's face it, we're not robots issuing warnings, we're people. People have different understandings, knowledges, biases, and, and everything else. That affects how things evolve in the service that is provided from one office within the office and to the next office. So we got to really understand that human element. We can't get rid of it, okay? But we can understand and recommend and maybe mitigate any negative effects that it might have. And that's what we're going to do once we get the full uh, load of uh, survey done and uh, assessed and therefore get some recommendations based on it all. So I'll take you through a few uh, slides here with some of the initial results. Okay, this one. Question was, how many tornado warnings have you issued in the last three years? Now three years, who knows? I mean, it could have been a very uh, period of hardly any tornado, tornadoes, so three years is a long period of time, but it's hard to remember what I did yesterday sometimes, let alone three years ago. So this was just kind of a general idea of how many warnings have you issued. Now with tornado warnings, you're not going to have a lot of warnings to be issued anyway, but this is a striking uh, graph here. Nearly one in five or one in six in between the two have issued no tornado warnings in the last three years. None. Sixty percent, five or less. 83%, 10 or less. If you're a baseball player and you've had 10 at bats in the last three years, your batting average isn't going to be very good. You don't have much time or chance to practice. You're not going to become that good or that proficient. So that's one of the goals here, to enhance personal confidence through this expert curriculum that we're trying to develop and through effective strategies to integrate data in the right way to produce the right results and the right decisions. All right, next question here has to do with office culture. Management fosters a positive work environment and participates in severe weather ops. Well, we like this uh, graphic here. Three quarters of the people, this is all respondents, agreed with that statement. That's good to, that's good to know. However, we break it down into bargaining unit and non-bargaining unit, so managers and forecasters, we see the same overall trend, but certainly a difference. 97% of the of managers agree with that statement. It looks like there's two people, a little bit of the centers here, not quite sure. And only 67%, however, of the bargaining unit agree with that. So again, it's still the right trend. The majority agree. So in, in, for the most part, that's good. This is what we want to see. However, there are a number of folks who are not so thrilled about this statement, okay? And in the written discussion, we, there was optional where you could put in comments. There was several comments here of fear, some Monday morning quarterbacking, and severe weather ops that just weren't as positive as they could be to facilitate the best possible DSS, okay? Again, these are probably minority, but it's not something to ignore. It's something that needs to be addressed, and how can we mitigate and, and produce a better type of environment to produce a better decision and better result? All right, so we want each staff member should feel supported by management. And again, this is not a knock on management. This is just something that we want to make sure that it's uniform and, and unified across the region everywhere of a positive work environment to produce uh, the best possible circumstance. All right, next question here. I worry about repercussions from management if I issue a warning, tornado warning, but no tornado occurs. So this basically is a false alarm. Interesting, most folks are not worried about repercussions if they issue a tornado warning, but it doesn't verify. Now, we're assuming that is based on a good scientific approach to that warning, but they're not so worried about any uh, backlash from that. Okay, some do, obviously. 
However, if we turn that around a little bit and we say, I worry about management repercussions if I don't issue a tornado warning, but a tornado occurs, now that's a missed event. All right? And as you can see, we see a little bit different uh, display here on the histogram. There is many more who worry or fear repercussions from a missed event. Okay? Not issuing a warning, the tornado occurs. I mean, that's natural. That's, that's human nature. Both of these questions are basically human factors. And both these questions mean that there is a higher likelihood that a tornado warning will be issued uh, for both of these questions. So again, the first one, the false alarm, if folks are less worried about repercussions for a false alarm, then it's more likely that they might issue one, okay, assuming they've gone through the process and the science and, and made a, a, a good decision here, okay, because they're not worried about the repercussion. But on the other hand, um, if they fear missing something, they may rather be safe than sorry, so they may issue when they're on the fence. So both of these will produce a likelihood of more tornado warnings, which may produce a better probability of detection, but it might also produce a higher FAR. Okay? This is basically, again, human factor. Now, science goes into these decisions, but we want to make it, again, more science-based, less human-based. Next question was, tornado warning process can vary much between, or considerably, between forecasters in the same office. This is a very telling graph. 65%, two-thirds, agree with that statement, that the process, the tornado warning decision process can vary considerably between people in the same office. All right, kind of a sister question to that is the tornado warning process, decision process, is it consistent between WFOs? Okay, we switched the question around. Now, is it consistent? So you see the results skewed to the left, meaning that a lot of folks either aren't sure, they're neutral, or they disagree with that statement, meaning it's inconsistent. Okay, so basically it's the same result. There's this perception of inconsistency in the process within the same office and from office to office. Okay? Well, we know that the warning process must be consistent. We want it to be consistent. We want it to be more scientific. We want it to be less biased. All right? So as a team, we want to facilitate this better consistency through better expert training, better data interrogation strategies. All right, next one here is a radar question. There was a radar section. All right, we want to make sure folks are using the right data sets in the right way. Question is, um, it's a question. You use one panel half degree reflectivity and storm relative motion as your primary, excuse me, primary method to assess tornado potential. Not as what you use for your warning screen, that's different, but you use half a degree, one panel, as your primary way to assess tornado potential. We hope folks interpreted this correctly because we see an interesting uh, type of distribution here, pretty even across the board. There's a lot of folks who are using that, apparently, as a primary tornado potential. And everyone's going to use that, obviously, but to us, it's like, well, there's a lot more than that. We know that everyone knows that there's a lot more than that, but we'd like to see that the answer there is more, you know, never, not never or rarely, it's more ne never or rarely, meaning that there's a lot more to assess and there's equal importance with a lot of different types of data, not just looking at a half degree, especially as you get close to the radar when a half degree may actually undershoot a particular circulation. Okay, what about spectrum width? Do you use spectrum width to assess tornado potential? And here, most folks don't, okay? It's not one of those, I mean, it's been around forever, but it's not one of those go-to parameters, apparently, that folks use to help make their decision. Well, studies have shown, some recent study, we even had a Holling student here at Louisville last summer, I'm sorry, two summers ago, that actually did some correlations here. We found uh, some correlations between values of spectrum width and tornado occurrence, and I know that type of study has been repeated uh, from a, a couple other locations across the region as well. So again, the, the point of this slide is there's data there that, uh, you know, folks may not be using that may have value in making the decision or may not be looking at all the right things or in the right way necessarily all the time to make that decision. Or different people are using different methods again. Right, we asked, the tornado warning decision is harder than the severe, severe thunderstorm decision. All right, 
people, again, had a nice distribution here. 35% felt that the tornado warning decision was harder than the severe decision. 23 weren't sure. 42 disagree, but that's 58% of the people that weren't sure. So there's there is this reluctance out there that, okay, it's harder for me to pull the trigger and make that decision than a severe decision. I have an easier time with that. We don't want that. We'd like to see it just as easy uh, and based on the science to make both decisions. Okay, once folks do make that decision, though, to issue a tornado warning, are they thinking about verification? Now, most people, the majority here, say they're not, but as you can clearly see, there's people that are neutral or agree with that statement. So definitely verification has relevance and influence in their mind as they're making that decision. And again, we saw that back in the, the, the ramifications, the repercussions from management slide. So bottom line here, I guess top line, that's what it says, enhance the top line process through science and expertise and, and, and consistency. You work on the top line, that'll produce a better bottom line uh, by default, okay? It's a basic leadership principle. Back to the baseball analogy, if that baseball player if he's uh, getting a lot of reps and, and working on his swing mechanics and, and learning the strike zone and, and laying off the off-speed pitches, he's going to get a better bottom line batting average by working on the top line process of improving his swing. I'm confident issuing a tornado warning for a supercell at the top, and then I'm confident issuing a tornado warning for a QLCS at the bottom. Different results. Most people feel more comfortable or confident with the supercell than the QLCS. It doesn't necessarily mean that all the warnings they're issuing for supercells are verifying, but they feel more comfortable in doing it. So therefore, this is a direct uh, slide that shows us there's a real need here to concentrate on QLCS torna tornado genesis dynamics, but we're also going to look at supercells as well. But that gives us the idea that this is our initial focus in terms of training to concentrate on the QLCS. Now, there's many more results uh, in, in, this, uh, in this whole survey here. They'll be available. They'll be posted. I'll show you that later where they'll go. And eventually, we'll come up with recommendations based on all these results. OK, so moving on to the next topic here, warning operations and the, and the severe weather operations plan. Um, most folks have a plan here. We don't want to delegate or tell you what you should or shouldn't have, but we want to just provide a general framework of suggest, suggested positions and, and roles to optimize ops. We also want to look at uh, some ways uh, and some tips for warn gen polygons to make them most efficient and to mitigate having multiple warnings for the same locations, which gives the perception of high or false alarm. And then something you guys are probably doing for the most part is radar sectorations by threat or by storm or by impact versus by geography alone. Communications. Uh, if you've read any national service assessments, you see that uh, frequent, fluid, and communication is vital for success is one of the headlines in those. So obviously, it's, it doesn't take an Einstein to know that active communications within the office and between office facilitate better awareness of storm trends and also service continuity. So we want to come up with some uh, recommendations to enhance this communication with each other, with our partners and social media. We have to make sure that service and process does not change across CWA boundaries. Okay? And then the last bullet, warning messages and the community response based on that messaging is a longer term project, nothing we're going to be looking at in the near future. Radar interpretation, next thing. All right, we've got some uh, recommendations that will be coming out here in the short term here. Some like one-pagers are easy to, uh, uh, to implement here. We, in, in these one-pager type recommendations, we, we have a recommendation and the basis for the recommendation tells you why we think it's important. Okay? One's dealing with mesal sales, with enabling raw uh, correlation coefficient in AWIPS, and disabling the clutter mitigation, because those help to produce better detection of TDSs. We'll give some guidance with storms that look at different locations from the radar and how they appear based on their distance. Radar color curves. We're about to send out a, a, an email to the Twipples and the Sioux soliciting different radar uh, color curves for different radar products from which we'll look at and try to come up with the best of the best for each product so that they identify the important features depending if it's a QLCS or if it's a supercell or if it's a cool season or a warm season type event. And these will then be provided to all offices. We have two people on our team, plus a couple collaborators looking at unworn events from 2014-15 and coming up with lessons learned from that. And that will be shared. 
And then also a radar features catalog, which is a neat type thing that we're working on. And I'm going to let Jason Schaumann, who's on our team, lead forecaster out of Springfield, uh, talk about this slide and what he's doing with that. Jason? Uh, thanks, Ted. Yeah, basically a, a way to look at these radar feature catalogs, it's, it's, it's a modern version of flashcards. We all remember those from grade school or multiplication tables. What we are really looking to do is build upon foundational training that you may get through modules or peer-reviewed literature, uh, those types of things. But we're, we're, we're building that muscle memory. We're, we're, we're making these features recognizable almost subconsciously over time. So you talk about features and supercells that are common with tornadoes. Maybe you're getting to the ZDR realm or forward flank, rear flank downdraft signatures. You know, QLCS is uh, front inflow pair front inflow, rear inflow notches, um, what's the updraft, downdraft convergence zone. What we're looking to do is build pages of these features that will be available when it's uh, still shot, MP4 animations, and then also give you the ability to download these cases and, and further explore uh, the, these radar features. Um, eventually what we will be looking to do perhaps later this year then is build further upon those radar feature catalogs and then go into short narrated uh, events, maybe five minutes or so to where we're actually describing a case unfolding with these features present and then go into the proper warning decision that should be made. Uh, one final comment here uh, to the group and then Ted, you can take back over, is that uh, for the TWIP liaisons out there in the SUS, if you've, you've got good cases uh, of some of these radar features, we would absolutely love for you to send those along to us. All right, great, Jason. Thank you. The next topic is conceptual models and trading. And again, this is the bulk of the work will be done here. Uh, the eventual goal is to come up with some sort of comprehensive, like WAC. It used to be called AWAC, now it's WAC, Warning Operations Course Tornado Track that WDTD has done with other types of severe and core nodes. That we've developed something with a tornado track, or at least some sort of tornado warning improvement course. Now, if we waited to give that to you all, when it was done, you'll be waiting a couple years. So we want to provide it information in pieces that you can digest and, and learn and implement as, as we go. And we'll continue to provide these modules. And eventually, they will build up to become a comprehensive course. All right. And delivering things in more finite pieces, I think, is a better way as well. You're not inundated with a ton of training that you all of a sudden have to do. So here's some of the things that we'll be looking at, some detailed conceptual models um, and updates to those models and, and tornado dynamics uh, and formation dynamics here for QLCSs and supercells, land spouts, what those are and, and, and ways to potentially handle them, uh, radar sampling and contaminations due to side lobes and three-body scatter spikes, working, like I said, with, uh, with Penn State on some dual pole analysis and using that, not just CC data, but even ZDRs and ZDR columns for, for tornado detection. Um, MRMS data and how we can use that in the process. And then other types of things, which I don't have all listed here, but we got GO16 now. What about the GLM data, the lightning data? When we learn from that, and that's been looked at in the hazardous weather test bed, um, but how can we use that potentially in the decision process as well? Um, this just gives you a quick, on the right side here, I'm not going to go through all that, but this just gives you a quick and dirty look at some of the modules that we're working on just for the QLCS uh, conceptual model. So there's a bunch of stuff here. This will not be delivered all by this spring. There might there'll be a couple things coming out. Uh, but it just gives you an idea of some of the things that are going on behind the scenes here and the, the, the comprehensiveness of the effort that's being put forth to pro provide this type of level of expert training. All right, so speaking of training. We don't want training just to be something that just comes and goes. We've all taken training, lots of training, and there's been a lot of good training that we've all taken, and the folks have put it together do a great job. Um, but there comes a time when sometimes you do so much training that you're like, it gets to be, well, you learn it, and you know, if you're watching a module on your, on, your, on your PC or whatever, maybe your eyes get a little droopy at times. And then you take the quiz and you check the box and you make your suit happy and you've done the training, okay? And you may retain that for a period of time and you know sometimes you lose it. You don't use it, you lose it type, type scenario. So we want to develop another process, the training process, a series of phases here that, that helps you learn 
and retain. Learn, practice, and retain, okay? And then relearn and reuse. So five phases here, I'll go through this really quickly. It's just background materials, uh, literature, modules, videos, webinars, hands-on training then is important to this process. And this isn't just training for everyone doing the same thing, but you've got to understand individual needs and do one-on-one -on -one training as well. Proctored simulations go in this category. Uh, support references, tools, quick references, these data strategies I've mentioned, A2 procedures, which I'll talk about in a second. Phase four is refresher training, short simulations, event reviews. We learn better when we have a short, finite uh, type of, of, of training, not some big, long, drawn-out type thing. People learn better with shortness, okay? So we want to get that in, in that radar features catalog um, <coughs> that, that was just discussed by Jason will help with that as well. And then the expert level, you really get to the end of that road, or at least you're going in the direction to at the end of the road in the expert level, training others, RTO. So it's not a linear progression necessary from one to another, but uh, it's, you know, people are at different levels in here. But again, we want to make sure that all this effort uh, becomes second nature, like the back of your hand, and is then put into operations, and the benefit is the bottom line, uh, better service. Our data interrogation strategies, another area that we're looking at here, obviously we know there's many data sets exist. You can look at the list there. That may not even be all the list. I won't repeat all those, but there's tons of information and it's not getting better. It's, I don't know if it's getting worse. More data is, is good, um, but you can only process and handle so much. So our goal then, as I've alluded to already, is to provide better ways to look at all the data. What data should I look at? What situation per what storm mode, okay, to, that I can look at and, and process and not get overwhelmed with in the period of time that I have to do so and make the, the educated decisions based on that. So data assessment strategies, AWIPS bundles uh, and perspectives will, will come out from that. That's a tough one. Uh, that's not something that will be done easily or very quickly, but it's a definitely a very important one and something we'll be looking at as we go forward as well. Uh, the next two slides here, I'm going to kick it back over to Jason. He's going to talk about mesoanalysis and another tool that's coming out. Uh, thanks, and thanks again, Ted. Yeah, one of the things we're really hammering down on, is, is, as Ted talked about, is the process of making sound warning decisions. You know, what are we looking for on radar or, or, or the mesoscale? You know, what to look for, when to look for it, how to look for it, why to look for it. Uh, it's the integral parts of that process. And when it comes to the how part of it, uh, we want to provide tools. You know, Ted's talked about a few of those already, and, and then some of the the color scales, uh, AOS procedures, perspectives. Um, one of the other tools we're going to feature and roll out this spring to, to central region office is what we call the digital cursor readout. So this is a joint project uh, with the National Near Storm Environmental Awareness Team. And, Basically, the way to think about this is you, know, you, you plot something in AOF, say it's a SIGTOR parameter. You can plot it as contours, uh, or you can also plot it as an image. Um, you know, if you want to get any kind of sampling, you got you to plot that image, uh, turn on your sampling, and you're going to get values that read out. Well, that's all great, fine, and dandy until you want to overlay that on top of a radar image. You, you load an image on top of a radar image, you, you're not going to be able to interpret anything. So uh, we've created that, that third option for radar operators and meso analysts to be able to get uh, readouts at your, wherever you drag your cursor of, of numerous parameters. And we're talking um, indices, we're talking critical levels. Um, and Ted, if you advance one more slide there, I believe you're going to see the menu structure uh, show up there of all the different uh, bundles catered to hazard and then also individual parameters that are available. So this is going to be a huge benefit to radar operators uh, when it comes to not just making tornado warning decisions, but then also mesoanalysts because you're able to plot these these parameters out into the future for a RAP or, or an HRRR and, and ascertain that near storm environment. So again, look for those to come out this spring and that will have uh, job sheets with them. Great, very good, Jason. Yeah, these are, these are things we're really excited about, some new things that we think will really be helpful. 
All right, let's move on to the last uh, main section of uh, what I showed near the beginning here of the things we're working on is verification and event reviews. Okay, storm damage survey training. This is another thing that uh, we feel needs some attention. Not only is it the process of making the decision to issue the warning, okay, but it's training on how to do the storm survey correctly. I mean, I think there's very there's varied ways or and applications of what folks are doing uh, to come up with uh, decisions of, of tornadoes and straight line winds. So we want to try to uh, make that more consistent if possible by providing some training. Again, not a, a real near-term thing, but something that definitely will be on the burner and, uh, and moving forward here because it obviously directly uh, affects the verification, not necessarily the decision to warn, but the verification, which is the bottom line based on that top line process that we were talking about earlier. So we'll look for some of that. Um, our team will be available if requested to help any local offices with any challenging cases. Uh, we encourage you guys, again, to make frequent uh, assessments of what you're doing as an office and as an individual and get lessons learned from those. I mean, I know you guys do that now. I mean, I'm not saying anything that, that's like earth shaking here. Obviously, you guys do that, but more frequency is good. And that can be then brought back up to us and perhaps put into to that radar features catalog, which obviously then helps everybody else. Um, so that's, th th those are good things. And the last bullet here is we talked about on our team, we haven't done anything about it yet, is maybe develop some sort of post-mortem template. We don't want to tell you guys how to do a post-mortem. They don't have to be dissertations, okay? They can be short and sweet directed on one element but maybe to provide some sort of guidance or template might not be a bad thing. Okay, so let's get into the short and long-term goals here. We'll be wrapping this up shortly. Uh, short-term goals, these are by early spring, don't have a definitive date by, uh, but by March and then continuing into April. Now, some of you across the region may already be doing severe weather training or will be shortly, and this might be after that fact, or some of you in the northern part of the region may not be doing this until a little bit later. So we'll be getting information out here uh, to start, and then it will continue to, through 2017 and beyond. So the first things we're trying to get out here is, is again, the full results from that uh, survey that I showed you, some selected results. Now, we won't have all the recommendations from it yet, but you'll definitely get to see all the results and some of the comments. And I think, again, you'll find all those pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, some of these one-pager recommendation memos that I talked about related to ops and radar and communications, the first couple or few modules of uh, this tornado warning track course that we want to eventually put together focus on QLCSs because we saw from the survey that that's where the need is. Uh, maybe something by then on land spouts as well and also some NSC and things dedicated to shear and then photographs and how to use that in the process of uh, your thoughts. Um, the radar features catalog, as Jason mentioned, initial release. Okay, we want to get something out there. By no means we'll have everything that will eventually go in there. But again, that's where you guys help us by getting more examples, and that helps everyone else then as well. And then again, as Jason mentioned, additional digital cursor readouts, that's going to be a really neat thing as well. And we're going to try to get that pushed out here as soon as we can. And then long-term goals, let's get into FY18 and beyond. And I think this TWIP team could be around for a few years. We'll see. Um, there's always going to be more to do. Uh, you know, more training to eventually come up with this comprehensive tornado track curriculum. There's always going to be new technologies, new data sets that are going to have to be evaluated and integrated into the decision process and strategies of how to handle that. Okay? Um, so we'll get into these, again, these interrogation strategies, these procedures. We might not wait to necessarily FY18 to get any of those out. We might be soliciting those from, from the local offices as well to take a look at some of those. Um, but to really get deep and get a full set of those won't be anything that can happen right away, but that will be an ongoing uh, type of, of uh, effort here uh, moving forward over the next several months and into next fiscal year as well. And then we want to narrow the range of personal issuance probabilities. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, we want to narrow the range. This is a human factor. Okay, let's say we have old Bob over here, and Bob doesn't like to... Uh, Bob doesn't like to miss any tornadoes, and he's okay with having false alarms, but he's not going to miss anything. Okay, so old Bob, he's going to issue a tornado warning when he's 30% confident that a tornado might occur in this situation. 
All right. But then we got old Betty over there in the same office who. What do you mean? I don't know what that was. We've got old Betty over here, and uh, she's willing to, uh, you know, she wants to make sure that she's only issuing when she has more confidence. She's more conservative, so she doesn't, <clears throat> she doesn't want to have as big of a false alarm. So she's going to only issue when she's 70% sure of uh, there being a tornado. So we got two people in the same office with a 30 versus a 70% personal issuance probability, and that's a big gap. That's for these differences that we see that we saw in one of those graphics from the from the uh, survey. So we're never going to eliminate that gap, but we want to narrow that gap again as we base things in science and repetition and references and examples. So folks are using the same uh, process as much as possible and making decisions again grounded as much in science as possible and less biased by the human factor, which again will never go away, but hopefully we can mitigate. Uh, by understanding the principles at hand. Uh, messaging and social science, that will be a longer type thing. And then probabilistic warnings and facets is a big deal, obviously, uh, but it is a longer term goal right now. And it is interesting, we did do in the survey, uh, we had a question about probabilistic tornado warnings would be an improvement over the deterministic re approach that we do now. And, and folks really weren't sure. You see a perfect bell-shaped curve here. A lot of people just aren't sure. Some agree, some disagree. But again, that's that's important. That's something we'll be looking at in a little bit longer term in this in this uh, in this team. So quickly, last couple slides here: content and materials. Where will all this stuff be housed? Uh, right now, we have two locations. We have a Google site, and we have a VLab presence. And all our materials, when they're delivered, will be put in there. They can be downloaded from there as well. We are not sharing those sites yet because we don't have them fully configured, and we're going to wait until we get the initial material delivered. So in summary, all right, first and foremost, that's why it's the top bullet. National Weather Service has the best meteorologists and best warning staff in the world, okay? Second to none. But that doesn't mean we can't improve. We saw that's why we exist, okay? So you got to recognize your own personal needs, right? What do you need? What does Bob need? What does Betty need? Right? They don't need the same thing necessarily, okay? And what are your personal biases? And understand how that affects your actions your warning process, how it affects others in your office, and how your office affects the next office across from you, okay? And the third bullet, we've heard this a lot, uh, be open-minded to change new ideas and more efficient methods. A lot of people, you know, you're inundated with a ton of data, you can't handle it. You go and go back to your top three to five items which make you comfortable and which you always use to issue warnings. Okay, we want to get you out of that. We want to make sure we have these strategies that you can look at other things that are important. Remember, spectrum width is important that folks don't use as much, okay? We want to get you out of the, the comfort and into the science and reality of what is best and the best way to produce, again, the best results. So continually sharpening your own skills, sharpening your own saw is the way to go here so that the little graphic here on the right is people working together in a team effort to produce success. This summary slide is basically a leadership slide. That's all it is. So, but it, it obviously it, it has great ap ap applicability here. So that's all I got right now. Uh, that's the end of the presentation. So we have a good 15 minutes or so, and I'm going to let John open it up to anyone who wants to ask us a question. And I thank you very much for your time, and uh, we're here working with you and for you. So anytime you guys have any ideas or things that you want to ask us about, I mean, we'll gladly take the input. So thank you. Okay, if you have a question, uh, you can uh, click the little raise your hand or type in a question, uh, and uh, we'll open the line up for you. I think we had a question. It was a while back. I don't know if you got to it or not. Um, Matt Bunkers, you had a question? Uh, no, I didn't have a question. I just suggested that the spectrum width studies be made available because uh, it's not really something I'm familiar with. I haven't found spectrum width to be really showing me anything above what I already know. It's fairly dependent on the velocity data set. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, that's something that can uh, get as much of that together as, as, as we can as soon as we can get that out. I mean, it's nothing that, uh, you're right, Matt, I mean, it's not anything that is necessary uh, 
new, but it's just something that's not used as much. I guess it's more of an awareness that there's there's information there, and you can see it. Sometimes it identifies these circulations and these boundaries even better than sometimes velocity at times. So, and sometimes an inflow flank, as you know, that you can see some important features. So again, it's an awareness for folks who are not as uh, used to seeing that type of data. Okay, thanks, Matt. And let's go to Ryan now. Go ahead, Ryan. You're unmuted. Hey, everybody. Um, I have a question about. Uh, I guess it may fall under the radar features catalog. Um, one thing I've had an idea of is having like a notebook uh, where there'd be like common tips or best practices or features um, to help the radar operators real time. Um, you know, remember some of these things. For example, uh, like the dual pole one pager, or uh, um, I think there was one on um, trying to estimate tornado strength uh, from some of the radar features, and it gave some box and scatter plots and stuff like that. Um, how extensive are you thinking you may get with uh, one pagers or or you know radar aids that can be used right there in the warning environment? Jason, you want to address that? It's kind of related to the radar features catalog. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's a great question, Ryan. Uh, and we, uh, we we plan on using the the one pagers extensively. Uh, they're going to be a uh, a pretty good complement to the radar features catalog. And again, we're we're building the muscle memory. But when it, when it comes to the one pagers, uh, the one page primers, um, you, you're going to see a lot of those come out. Um, you know, one of the common ones that we're using for QLCS is now um, Michael Matthews in the Bismarck office drew up um, where it talks about the three ingredients method and some of the common radar features we're seeing uh, with these tornadic signatures. So, you know, we're not just going to throw these out there and say here, but they're going to complement that foundational training with the modules, the literature, the radar features catalog. Those one pagers ultimately are those exactly what we're looking for when it comes to those supporting tools to help help uh, forecasters make warning decisions, better warning decisions. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, let's go uh, to Ken Cook. Go ahead, Ken. Hi, Ted. Um, I guess I just had a question. I know you asked um, how many people had issued a warning in the last five years or how many. I was curious to see if you had any data and how many people verified tornado warnings in the last, or how many times they verified tornado warnings in the last five years. I think that could be a big difference in that data set. Well, we're already looking at low numbers there, Ken, for issued. Since we know we generally have high FAR for tornado warnings, I think the, uh, the verification numbers would be even a smaller number. So yeah, that would be interesting. But I think just the practice actually issuing uh, tells a lot in itself. But yeah, I think if you looked at the verification, um, well, I guess if you'd issue three and you verified two, you're 66%, so that's actually pretty good. I guess if you're looking at the total number, though, it might, uh, it might be an interesting stat, and I think would would support again the need for looking at this stuff for all of us, this team included. Yeah, I agree. I, I just think uh, I think you guys, you know, just keep up your hard work because it's just a uh, big. I think the tornado warning and severe weather in general, but especially tornado warning aspects, are, are really critical. We don't get a lot of reps with that even here. I mean, you know, I've got some forecasters that. We'll do 10 to 15 a year, maybe, and that's probably on the high side uh, across the region. I think uh, you know a lot of people would go several, a couple, of, maybe three years without even issuing one, let alone verification. So, um, just wanted to make that comment. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Let me just say, I mean, when we first got this team together, I mean, we've been uh, tasked with what I think is a daunting task, and as we talk more and more, we come up with more ideas. Thinking, man, this is. <laughs> really if you think about overwhelming and daunting how much there is that can be done to try to improve this process. So I mean it took a while for our team to really get going in the fast lane uh, <clears throat> for 
versus spinning our wheels trying to figure out how do we proceed, what do we do, how does roles within the team fall out, but I think we're starting to really pick up the pace here. Again, we're still working uh, our normal jobs, but we're, uh, we're trying to uh, do as much as we can to get as much as we can uh, out as quickly as we can. Okay, any other uh, questions? Okay, well, uh, Ted, I'll turn it back to you and uh, to wrap it up. Hey, John, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Yeah, John, this is uh, Mike uh, from Des Moines. Uh, I had one question that I was, uh, maybe something that the team uh, knows. There was a study, it looks like, by uh, Kyle Ortega and Travis Smith that was at uh, Miros, I guess it's called, where they were basically looking at um, historical radar uh, features, and then they were trying to apply probabilities and such. Does anyone know where that stands? Is that being looked at as part of this project, or does anyone know if that's going to be something that's going to be available down the road? Anybody on the team should be unmuted. Anybody have any comment on that one first? Hey, Ted, this is Ray. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, I know that's a study that's a, a work in progress, and uh, it's aimed at helping provide some probabilistic guidance on the uh, radar-related features that can help pin down various aspects of severe weather, including tornadoes. So I suspect sometime in the unknown future we will be seeing that. What we're trying to do a little as well is we provided each of the, the offices, the, again, the, the TWIP liaison or the, and, and or the SU, uh, a folder on our TWIP site where they can upload pertinent things like color curves or cases, and that includes um, research, uh, either peer-reviewed or local robust research that could be uploaded that might be interesting for us to, to look at and, and to see what utility there is. So um, again, there's the communications, we talked about communications between offices and whatnot, but the communication between this team and a local office is certainly as important, and we want to make sure that that continues. Uh, so again, if you have local things that you're, you're interested in and questions after this call, certainly you can contact us or, or, or run it through your, your Twipple or your Sue, who can then uh, contact us from there. Are there any other last questions? Sounds like not, so we'll wrap this up. Again, um, we're trying to do our best. We're, we're with you. We're working with you and we're trying to work for you and trying to do the best we can. But uh, we're using, again, we're using a lot of other resources and, and some really smart people and, and organizations to try to help with this. Um, we're not going to get it all. We're going to do this as best as we darn can. Um, but you guys are as much part of this process as we are, so we gladly take the input. I appreciate your time. Hopefully this sheds some light on what the heck we've been doing behind the scenes all this time. And now moving forward and, and this year and, and beyond, you'll start to see uh, things being delivered. And hopefully we'll all take the unified effort to improve ourselves and to improve our service and to do what our customers and our partners greatly deserve. So that's all I got. Again, thank you very much, and uh, we'll be talking to you soon.